Now in part one of this series we talked about the two kinds of money. Currency, which is uh, usually banknotes and coins created by the uh, central bank in your country, and credit, which is uh, the instruments uh, that are issued by private banks, uh, loans in other words. In this video I just want to focus on currency. In other words, the stuff we use as hand-to-hand -hand money. The stuff issued right now by your central bank, the banknotes, or the coins issued by your government. Now in the past, we have used gold coins or silver coins as currency. In other words, it was the money that people passed from hand to hand in exchange for property and uh, goods or for services. Now gold and silver have international appeal. You can go to just about any country in the world and people will see gold as being something of value. Uh, something that they think is pretty, something that they can turn into a practical use or even into a, uh, a, a piece of jewelry or something that they can wear. In other words, gold is something that people want. Because people want gold or silver, when they accept gold or silver coins as payment for their uh, property or for their services, they're doing so consensually. They're getting something they actually want and they're giving up something that they want less. It's something they want to do. No one's requiring them to do it. They don't feel forced or coerced in any way. The person on the other end of the bargain is doing the exact same thing. Uh, they're giving up uh, the gold or the silver in exchange for something they want more, the property or the services that the person has to offer. So the trade of valuable property for valuable property or a valuable property for uh, services is a consensual act. Both parties are consenting. There's no coercion involved. This is one way in which gold coins or silver coins differ from the banknotes printed by your central bank or from the base metal coins minted by your government. It doesn't matter what country we choose to talk about, whether it's Britain or Canada or the United States. Let's just go back to a time when the government of the country said, this paper will now be money in the country. Imagine how people felt at the time. Paper? Money? Just because you wrote some numbers on the paper, it's supposed to be money? Of what value is a bunch of paper to me? I can't wear it. I can't eat it. People don't want it the world over. If I take this money that's printed in Canada or by the Canadian government or the Canadian uh, Central Bank and I go to Pakistan or uh, uh, Russia or uh, any number of other countries, they're going to look at me strangely if I try to pay for goods or services with that paper. And even in my own country at first, why would anybody want to accept payment in the form of paper for real, tangible goods or for services? Well, that would be the question that first occurred to the government before it proposed that paper was to be money. And the answer that all of the governments came up with is this, the law of legal tender. Now, you may have seen on one of your central bank notes uh, something that says something to the effect of this note is legal tender for all trades of goods and services, etc. What does legal tender mean? Well, contrary to popular belief, legal tender is not the piece of paper. Tender is actually a verb, not a noun. A tender is an action. It's not an object. So when you take a coin or a note printed by your central bank and you give it to somebody uh, because they're going to be giving you goods or services in exchange, you're tendering that money to them. You're tendering that paper, tendering those coins. To tender is to give, to offer. So for example, you might tender your resignation, which is to say that you're giving notice of your resignation or you're communicating your resignation, you're giving your resignation. Well, that's what a tender is with money too. So what makes something a legal tender? What is legal about a legal tender? Well, first remember the purpose of law. The purpose of law is to dictate how the government can use force against people. In other words, police officers and other uh, officers of the state have guns. And ultimately, they could be called upon to use them. Now, most of the time, they don't. They're people who are respected because they have the uh, authority to use force. And so it's rare for police officers actually to pull out their guns. But the respect or the fear or whatever that we have of them ultimately is rooted in the fact that they are authorized to pull out those guns. Law is what permits them to take out those guns and use them. Law dictates when a government can use force, how a government can use force, how much force it can use, etc. So when we're talking about a legal tender, we're talking about tender 
that's backed in some way by guns, force, government force. Well, what are the situations? How does this all work? Well, imagine that you walk into a store and you take an object off the shelf and it says uh, on the ticket price there, $20. And so you take that object and you go to the cashier and you pull a $20 central bank note, you know, whether it's a Federal Reserve note or a Bank of Canada note or a Bank of England note. You take that note out of your uh, wallet, you put it on the cashier's table and you say, there you go. Now, imagine, hypothetically, that the cashier said, no, we only take credit here. You can only pay by credit card, or you can only pay by coin, or something along those lines. Well, if the exact price was $20, and you offered exactly $20 in uh, Bank of Canada notes, or Federal Reserve notes, or whatever may be the official currency of your country, the law of legal tender says, you offered, you tried to pay, the fact that they turned it down is their own business. Take that object and walk out of the store. It's yours. In other words, the law of legal tender says that the property in that object that you took off the shelf is transferred to you whether or not the store owner decides to accept your $20 central bank note. Here's another example. Let's say that you've been living in a rented apartment for a whole month and that the cost of the apartment for one month is $900. Imagine you went to your landlord with $900 of uh, your central bank's currency and you offered to pay your rent with that $900. And imagine that the landlord said, no, I don't accept uh, currency as payment, I want a check or I want a credit card payment, etc. Well, Literally, he could not then sue you for the rent of that month. You offered to pay him in the currency of the country, which was a legal tender, because the law said it was a legal tender. And because it was a legal tender, you've paid him, as far as the law is concerned, whether or not he took the bills out of your hand. If you walk out of his office with the bills still in your pocket, having already offered to pay him with those bills, too bad, so sad, the rent's been paid. He can't sue you. That is the law of legal tender in practice. Now when something is actually valued by someone, for example a gold coin, uh, independently of any law, then trade with that coin is not coercive. And the role of the government in that situation is merely to make sure that whoever owns a gold coin continues to own a gold coin until he or she trades it for something else or gives it to someone else. The role of government when uh, gold coins are money is to protect the owner's uh, ownership, to ensure that that person is not deprived of their ownership of the coin, uh, to, in other words, ensure that they are not expropriated. Legal tender laws reverse that. Legal tender laws turn these pieces of paper into claims on the use of government force. A central bank note, because it can be used to make a legal tender, is a note that can be used to expropriate someone and you can expropriate them legally because the government will not allow them to sue you for non-payment of a debt. The law effectively says you get their stuff even though they didn't get anything from you. So with legal tender laws, a government isn't only a protector of property, it's also an expropriator of property. The role of government changes from mere defense of property to expropriation. Let's go back to the example of the landlord. And let's assume that the landlord knows the law of legal tender, and he knows that if he doesn't take that central bank currency, uh, he's not going to receive anything for the one month of uh, room that he gave you. You might argue that because he agreed to be paid with that central bank money, he consented to the transaction, and that therefore it can't be said that he was in any way coerced. That line of argument is flawed. The fact that a person agrees to be paid with fiat currency, with currency that's subject to these legal tender laws, uh, does not mean that they consented to the payment in that form. 
Now, let me walk you through a couple of examples to demonstrate that point. First, let's use an example that doesn't involve money per se. Imagine that your employer says to you, sign this letter of resignation and leave, or else I'm firing you. Now, in a situation like that, even if you sign the letter of resignation, you have not resigned. You've been fired. And that's why the law recognizes that fact. Even if you sign a letter of resignation, the common law recognizes that you were in fact coerced. That in fact, it was a termination by your employer, it was not a voluntary resignation. The fact that you agreed does not mean that you consented. The same goes with fiat currency, with currency that is subject to legal tender laws. The fact that you agreed to be paid with central bank notes does not mean that you consented to be paid with those notes. The fact remains that you will have lost your opportunity to, for example, sue that tenant for non-payment of the rent. Either way, whether you accept payment or whether you don't accept payment in the form of those central bank notes, you lose the right to sue that tenant for the rent. You didn't consent to the loss of that right to sue. It was taken from you. The room was taken from you on terms that you didn't agree to. Now let's consider an example that does involve fiat currency, although not the kind you're used to. Imagine that you're willing to accept a fresh apple in exchange for a $1 silver coin. Now imagine that your government has passed a law, brand new law, saying that if a person tenders an apple core in exchange for a $1 silver coin, then whether or not you agree to accept that apple core as payment, you will be deemed by law to have been paid for that $1 silver coin. And the person who paid with that apple core, or attempted to do so, now owns the silver coin. You, on the other hand, are left with an apple core, having lost your silver coin to the person who tendered the apple core. That was an exchange that you would never have consented to, and that in fact you did not consent to. Even though you agreed to receive the apple in exchange for the coin, you were coerced into giving the coin in exchange for that apple core. You were coerced, not only by the law, but ultimately by the person who used the law, the person who tendered that apple core. And if you take that apple core and turn around and use it to buy somebody else's $1 silver coin, you too will have coerced somebody. Non-fiat currency, things like gold coins and silver coins, do not give anyone the power to harm anyone. The fact that you own a gold coin or that you tender a gold coin does not mean that you have a right to take the person's property or that any debt you may owe to him is erased. It's not the case. If they choose not to accept a gold coin or a silver coin as payment because they never agreed to in the first place, well, you still owe for whatever it is you take from that person. And you owe whatever it is they and you agreed would be the adequate payment or the proper payment for that thing. The government does not inv involve itself in deciding what is deemed to be a payment. Uh, the parties are left to freedom of contract, the power to decide what will be traded for what. There's no coercion involved. In contrast, legal tender laws give everybody the power to coerce everybody else. The power to take goods or services from others without giving others the things they want in exchange. Legal tender laws, in short, give every man the right to expropriate his fellow man. You might argue that because most people don't know about legal tender laws, because they don't know that they can be expropriated if they don't accept central bank notes as payment, that there's no coercion involved, that all of these transactions we're doing with uh, central bank currency are completely consensual. If a transaction does involve uh, two or more people, none of whom know anything about legal tender laws so that none of them realize they're using a tool of expropriation, then I would agree with you, there is no coercion involved. You might then go a step further and say that therefore fiat currency, central bank notes, that are backed by you know, legal tender laws, are not tools of coercion. That would be a step too far. Consider that rifles are tools of coercion, even if everybody uses them as crutches and has no idea that they can be used to blow someone else's head off. The real question here is this. If it's true that nobody understands legal tender and nobody feels coerced when they're using central bank notes, shouldn't we just repeal legal tender laws and see if central bank notes retain their value? See if people continue to receive them as payment voluntarily? If your answer is no, consider what you're endorsing. And in any event, consider this. Even if it's true that nobody understands legal tender laws or the implications of legal tender laws, 
Why has your government not repealed its legal tender laws?